Lord be with you. As the country preacher once said, I'd like to say a few things before I begin to speak. I am so delighted to be here with my prayer partner and friend, your pastor, Roger. And I'm grateful to see his wife again, Dee Dee, and also to experience hospitality in their home. And to meet you and have the privilege of being in worship, I've prayed for you since Roger first came here, learned about this church, and now to have the honor of uh, being here for the Carson Lectures and for morning worship, I give thanks to God for you and this opportunity to worship God together. And I thank you for your music ministry. I feel led into the presence of God by it. Thanks be to God. Now, our scripture lesson this morning is like traveling through the Pennsylvania countryside a bit. Imagine yourself uh, in the rolling hills of Pennsylvania, except they're not green. They're kind of as burnt grass there above what they call the Sea of Galilee. Uh, actually, we would look at it and see it as a good-sized lake, about five miles wide and eight miles long. It's in a part of Israel that is the confluence of three countries and a much disputed high ground that's battled over. Uh, and it's where Lebanon and Syria and Israel come together. And just below that, below the mountain range, are rolling hills. And on that type of a setting, our text takes place as Jesus preaches what uh, biblical scholars believe to be the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to read the most famous section of it as we go into the New Testament lesson, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1. And we read through the first 16 verses. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how shall it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This ends our reading. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. Thanks be to God. Pray with me, please. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Draw us into a deeper understanding of your purpose for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. A few years ago, my wife and I were living in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was on the faculty at San Francisco Seminary, and I wanted to end the year right. I wanted to get up early and go work out. I got up at 5 a.m. to go to 24 hours of fitness. It had been raining all night. It was so, such a downpour that when I got in the car, turned on the lights, put the wipers on full tilt, I could barely see a few feet in front of my car. Everything was dark. I started down Ross Avenue, 
noticed out my side window that the water was going over the curbs. It was really a torrential downpour. A couple of blocks later, my car came to a jerking halt. The engine had cut out and to my chagrin, a little bit of water had flipped up over the hood of this Nissan Sentra. I tried to start the car as the wipers were still going and the battery was working. Just tried to start again, and then I heard this disconcerting sound over the beating of the rain on the car, a gurgling sound. And instinctively, I put my hand down into the footwell next to me and felt cold water coming into the car. At that point, I put down the window, and to my great surprise, water was almost three-quarters of the way up to the door. I had driven into a flowing stream in downtown San Anselmo. Didn't know that it was there. Tried to start the car, and as the water came up over my ankles and started up my shin, I said, I need to do something here. The car was not starting. So I put down the window and said, I can either abandon this car or try to get it out. I hopped out through the window, heaved myself into the center post with all my weight and energy, and finally got the car to start to rock and finally started to move it backwards up the street. About a block up the street, still in about knee-deep water, I saw the first lights I'd seen of the day, two headlights headed toward me. I stopped and waved, and I said, help's on the way. The car stopped, looked at me, waited for a few seconds, turned around and went the other direction. I went back to pushing, got the water up to about ankle deep, finally tried to start the car again, and got it going on about three of the six cylinders and limped a few blocks back to the carport at my faculty house. Went into the house, did not want to wake up my wife and tell her what a klutz I'd been driving into this stream of water. Shed my wet clothes, got a pan, got the Lysol, got some towels, went back out to bail out the footwells in my car, had them pretty much, uh, the water pretty much out. When a lady came down the alley behind our house where all the carports were, and she had a big umbrella and uh, knee-high boots on, and she said, did you know that downtown San Anselmo is underwater? <laughs> I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, the stream backed up, and the, it's the high tide, and, and we are surrounded like a moat. We can't get out of here. And not until the tide goes out about 2.30 this afternoon will the water start to recede, and then we can get out of here. Well, by 2.30, I had the car pretty well dried out, and I was starting to search for a mechanic to see if I could get all six cylinders going. I found one open on New Year's Eve, went to the mechanic. He did a little something to help the car, but it was still pretty sick. Came back to a dark house because everybody in San Anselmo had their lights out. Found out that CNN had put our little city on national news as a city that had four feet of water rushing through downtown San Anselmo. And my wife had told some of her girlfriends about what I'd done. And to a person, they said, if we had seen water going over the curb, we would have turned around and come back home. If he had had one drop of estrogen in him, he would have done the same thing. <laughs> Two days later, I went to the Nissan dealership with my car and talked to the service manager. There were, he said, I have 20 mechanics, but only two of them are qualified enough to take a real look at your car. It has been in a flood. And by the way, you're dreaming if you think you can get those carpets dry and they're going to be okay. They've got to come out. You're going to have mold within six months. My darkness started to lift and the lights went on. Thinking I didn't have to make an insurance claim, I finally called Allstate Insurance. This morning in our text, Jesus is speaking to people in darkness. But God in the flesh looks out at them and sees their full potential. This is in the backwater of Israel. Peasant farmers, fishermen, people that aren't supposed to make a big hit or splash in the world. And yet God in the flesh saw their full potential and he looked out at them and he says to them, You are the light of the world. Now, the annals of church history record that some of them walked halfway around the then-known world. Acts 17 records this backhanded compliment that's given to them. These are the people that have turned the world upside down, and Jason has taken them in. What got into those Galilean peasants to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ, to be a light for Christ halfway around the then-known world? Let's explore that text this morning. 
And let's consider what it might mean for Highland Presbyterian Church to be the light of the world. Jesus goes on to say in verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hid. He's talking about a community of light. And God's strategy down through salvation history is to work through a community of called out people. Isaiah, speaking to the Hebrew people called by God, says to them in Isaiah 49, verse 6, you are to be light to the Gentiles, that my salvation might spread to the ends of the earth. Imagine that. God calling forth the people, wanting them to take the salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, did Israel do that very effectively or consistently? And one of the terms for the church in the New Testament is the new Israel. God's vision in the sun. You are the light of the world. God's strategy is to work through a group of people to be the light of the world. Right now, small groups of people are meeting. They're planning how many people they can kill, how they can best kill them, how they can wreak the most mayhem and destruction. And they're quite successful. A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated 9-11. We know what's been going on in the United States and in Europe. God's strategy is to work through communities of people to be light in the midst of darkness. To take you into the city of Lancaster as a community and be light where there is division, injustice, depravity. That in the midst of that darkness, the light of God's light might shine through you. He goes on in verse 15 to say this. No one lights a light and puts it under a bushel basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Here is an individual picture of light, not a communal picture. First century homes are not like ours. You didn't walk in and flip a switch and have a light go on. You walked into the home and you lit a wick on a little lamp that you could probably hold in your hand or not much bigger than that. You went over to the wall in your house that had a little ledge on it, and you put the light on a stand and it gave light to all in the house. The Apostle Paul, speaking about us being light, says to the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, verses 8 to 10, You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. The fruit of light is all that is good. And try and find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Now, in the context of our text this morning, we have what is pleasing to the Lord. We have a picture of nine traits in the most famous section of this sermon, the Beatitude section, about what is pleasing to the Lord. Each phrase or trait begins with the word blessed. It's in the Greek text of the New Testament, Markarios, and it was taken from a first century understanding of what happens with a couple giving birth to a much-wanted child. They are overflowing with joy. And here's a picture of what causes God to overflow with joy through us. Picture of traits that are not bought, not consumer-oriented, that the world can't touch no matter what our circumstances might be. Let's take a look at each one of these and think about that in terms of us being the light of the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? We have a clue about this from the Hebrew scriptures in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, where we're told that if my people who call me by my name will humble themselves, be poor in spirit, humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, God says he'll do three things. He'll hear us when we pray. He'll forgive our sins, and he'll heal our land. And folks, we are in a land today that's much broken. Our national and local elections reflect it. There is a huge need for the light of the world, God's people, to be a healing force in the midst of this division. 
If my people who call me by my name will humble themselves, be poor in spirit, pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Next is blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This means pretty much what you think it might mean. Person that's lost a loved one, mourning. Person that's lost a tremendous thing in their life, mourning. But the more spiritual meaning of it is brought out by many of God's people, and God chooses to use flawed people like you and me. He chose to use a man after his own heart named David. David lusted after his neighbor's wife, had sex with her, got her pregnant. Then to make matters worse, he plotted the murder of her husband before he took her as a wife. God was super upset. God sent the prophet Nathan to confront this man after God's heart, and God's heart came out through David. As he said, I've sinned against you, Lord God, and writes for us in Psalm 51 these words of what it means to truly mourn. Create in me, dear God, a pure heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Do our hearts truly break by what God's heart breaks with? And what we do? Do our hearts break with what breaks God's heart that's going on in Lancaster? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Next is blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, I ask you now, who wants to be meek? It has a meaning today that kind of of a Casper, milk toast, weak kneed person that really can't stand up and get going. But that's not what it meant in the original. Meek came from the equestrian world, and meek came from the oratory world of the first century. A Roman centurion that wanted a new war horse would go down to the horse trainer, and he'd find a mighty stallion, 1,200 pounds of flesh, trained to bit and bridle, controlled strength. You just pull back that rein, and that 1,200 pounds will go where you want it to go. Who wants to be meek? Who needs controlled strength this morning? It came from the world of oratory. A speaker who was giving a message, receiving heckling and jeering and people that try to get them off track. That speaker who could remain poised under pressure was called meek, a preos speaker. Who needs poised, poised under pressure? Who wants to be meek? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Next is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Here's a picture of a person spiritually seeking, and we know from Scripture that, that God's eyes search through and to and fro throughout the whole earth for those whose hearts might be open to him. Luke gives us a great picture recording the words of Jesus, where God is pictured as a woman searching after an expensive coin in her house, a uh, coin of great value, turns the house upside down, and when she finds it, she throws a party. God is pictured as a sheep farmer. One sheep doesn't get in, and that sheep farmer goes back out and finds the lost sheep. God is pictured as a waiting father for a prodigal son who's squandered their inheritance, who's disappointed them, who's caused great tears and grief of their parents. But God's a waiting father in this picture. The son comes back penitent, saying, I'm sorry, take me back as a servant. And this father takes him into full sonship and throws a party for him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful is next, for they shall receive mercy. Jesus gives us a beautiful picture of what is mercy in the well-known story of the parable of the good Samaritan. Now, to get it, we have to understand that the Jews hated the Samaritans and vice versa. And a Jew would go out of their way to walk all the way around Samaria from where Jesus was preaching this sermon just to get down to Jerusalem on a spiritual journey. They do, the shortcut was through Samaria. And this good Samaritan story is a picture of a Jew who finds a Samaritan beaten up by the roadside. And it's a holistic picture of mercy that doesn't just have the wounded person's... Uh, blows attended to, 
but they go on and take care of their hospital bill, their, their hotel bill, get them back on their feet, get them reintroduced to their journey of where they're going. When the church is light and mercy to the least of these, to those on the margins, not just in a token way, but in a holistic way, we don't just give them bread for a day, but we deal with a system that's denied the bread. We don't just give them help for a week or two, we help them get back on their feet and be reintroduced to society. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus talks about this later on in the same sermon. And we know from scripture, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from sin. People with a pure heart speak truth. Can your word be trusted? Do you tell the truth all the time? Do you cheat when you think no one's going to see that you're not paying your full income tax? In the church parking lot, do you stop the gossip and not continue the story because you really don't want to hear it and you're not going to pass it on? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this comes from sin. Next is blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And Jeremiah talks about peacemakers writing to the people of Israel in a second great captivity or exile in Babylon. First one being in Egypt. And he writes in Jeremiah 29, verses 7 to 10, about their anxiousness because, see, they had finally gotten the fact they disappointed God. They were sent into exile. They were sad about that. They wanted to go back home to Israel. They longed for that. Why can't we do it right now? And God sends Jeremiah to them. And here's what God says to them. Seek the welfare of the city where you are, for your welfare will be in their welfare. And the word welfare in the Hebrew text is the word shalom, peace. Seek the peace of the city where I have sent you. Light givers, seek the peace of Lancaster. Where is their darkness? Seek the peace of the city where God has placed you because in their peace will be your peace. What does it mean to strategically understand the wind of the Spirit in the midst of your fellowship to go and seek the peace of Lancaster? Your discernment of that has to do with your light giving. The final two Beatitudes are about persecution. Thank God we live in the United States. We have sisters and brothers whose homes and businesses have been destroyed, some of whom have been beheaded because they're Christ followers. They're followers of the Nazarene. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and utter all manner of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice, be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I had the privilege a few years ago to teach at the largest evangelical seminary in India, Union Biblical Seminary in Pune. And one of the things I would do on these annual trips to see where Christ was really growing the church is I'd interview people that were new Christ followers. So I interviewed former Hindus and former Muslims, and as you may remember the story of India under the Britons, um, it was divided. You have a Pakistani country that is highly Muslim, but you, the second largest living faith in India today uh, is Islam. I interviewed Sini, one of the students who was a former Muslim. Sini came from one of the wealthiest families in all of India, an industrial family worth multi-multi-millions. He was being groomed to take over the family business. He lacked peace. Well, they were well-to-do. They sent him to Mecca. Go get some peace, Sinni. Came back with a little bit of sense of peace, but still was restive in spirit. One night in a dream, Jesus spoke to him. Now, the business language of India, because of the Brits, is English. But his first language at the dinner table was Urdu. This person appeared to him in white, speaking in Urdu, and said to Sinni in a dream, my peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Peace be unto you. 
Sidney longed to know who this was and what this piece was about. That's what he wanted. Later that week, he was sent across town in family business, across New Delhi, car broke down, called a taxi, finished his business errand, called a mechanic, take care of my car, and the mechanic called him before he even finished the business errand and said, come get your car, there's nothing wrong with it, drive it home. So he drove it home. Next week, same business errand for the family, crossing New Delhi, the car breaks down in exactly the same place. He does the same thing, calls a taxi, calls the mechanic, Mechanic calls him again and says, Cindy, your car is all right. Come get your car. Drive it home. Third week, same business errand, crossing New Delhi. Car breaks down in exactly the same place. This time he gets out of the car, walks across the street into a church in the midst of a service, sits down in the back pew where a lot of you Presbyterians are today, and the preacher is saying the words of Jesus as he sits down. My peace I give you, not as the world give I to you. Peace be unto you. He comes up to the minister after the service is over and said, I want to meet Jesus. He's introduced to Christ. He goes home and tells his family he's become a follower of Jesus. He's got the peace of Christ, and it's just amazing. His family can't believe it. They're Sunni Muslims. They're not radicals. Some Muslims would immediately take the butcher block knife and kill their son or daughter if they said that. They did not. They just said, you either renounce that faith or you're no longer our son and you're disowned. You have one week to decide. One week later, Sidney leaves that house with a suitcase of clothes. They have a funeral for him, and he hasn't spoken to him since. They won't speak to him. He's graduated now from Union Biblical Seminary, and he's in the middle of a huge Muslim neighborhood in India planting a new church. Jesus ends our text by saying, let your light so shine before others that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Now, this is not some sort of a works righteousness. In fact, I got a call from the Allstate adjuster, adjuster about three days after I left my car saying, man, is your car messed up? It needs a new onboard brain computer. It needs all new uh, rest of electrical work and, of course, new carpets. And I thought somehow I was going to get that car squared up on my own effort. We don't do God's work on our own effort. It's the work of the Spirit, the light of Jesus shining through us. That the world out there might see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. God bless you, light of the world.